Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is the December 15th DevOps Lunch and Learn, where we talked about CentOS and the changes Red Hat is making, and what the alternatives are and how the industry is going to react. Uh, great conversation. It really stands the test of time. Um, even as we release this in March, I think the, the discussion brought up exactly the issues that uh, we're still grappling with. So enjoy the conversation. Rocky Linux has been busy. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I didn't know they were going to name a whole Linux distribution up to you. That's cool. <laughs> Yay! I'm, I'm well, surprised that Rocky hasn't come over there yet. But uh, <laughs> Well, it's I have to find the right people over there to, to migrate to. Actually, what I'd love to do is join up the folks starting Rocky Linux with or spinning off Rocky Linux with the decentralized web folks and see how far we can go. Is it actually going to be a company or is it just another? Uh, full, full org, actually. Okay. Full really? org. Yeah. yeah. Um, foundation. They're, uh, they're forking <clears throat> the, the whole send offs thing and trying to, <laughs> to rebuild. Wait, foundation doesn't say company, right? <laughs> it won't be a company. It won't be okay. a company. It'll be, it'll be an organization with a, uh, um, with governance and a few other different things, but um, yeah. If you have any contacts there, cool. Yeah, I do. I'll ju I'll jump for that. That's the, so I, I haven't been in these meetings at one o'clock because I've been on the HBCNG meetings at one o'clock, uh, and this this week uh, the management structure of HBCNG got so extremely overloaded with Rocky that we're not having a meeting today. So that's why I'm able to actually be here today. So. <laughs> Well, hook God. me up. What? So wait. It so they, that. What that mean? Yeah. So was was there rub? I. So what do you mean they got so over over overloaded with it? Just considering changing um, it, or so we, we'll do this with a Slack went from one tweet from GMK ended up causing the Slack to go from. I think like a thousand users to five thousand wow. in two days, um, and it just it got crazy. Oh, okay, uh, busy, just people, everybody signing up, managers jumping in, saying, "Hey, huh. here's hardware. Where can we throw our money? Where can we get this going?" Um, <laughs> wow. The the forums are went from I don't know how many people we have now. Uh, again, we we turned it on and then. Within a few hours, we had, let's see, uh, I can't even, it hasn't tallied yet. It's the thousands and thousands and thousands of users. That's super. Well, so, yeah. <clears throat> wow. As a, as a abandonment of CentOS? Well, Sorry, Rocky. CentOS basically announcing that they're EOLing CentOS 8 next year. Mm-hmm. Um, was such a well shift. moving to to continuous update, right? I mean, was well, it moving, moving essentially moving moving CentOS into essentially upstream as opposed to downstream. Is right. the yeah, actually that's right. Yeah, I hadn't thought about yeah. that. So that's so cool. you have you have Fermi Lab, you have um, all of the national laboratories, you have all of the you know huge HPC infrastructure, all reliant on this ten year cycle. Yeah. of releases that they basically just abandoned and in doing <laughs> yeah, my backgrounds are going crazy today um and basically just abandoned um this long-term release structure yeah. so it kind of caused a mass migration so it was it was kind of a excuse my language but it was a dick move by red hat and yeah um you know, it's, uh, let's, it was definitely IBM. Yeah, I was of. wondering when IBM was going to to really uh, up the volume on Red Hat dick moves. Because <laughs> well, Red Hat has a tendency towards them anyway. <laughs> well, is, is that an assumption or, I mean, there, nobody had a warning that this was coming. I mean, that that's why it's being called a dick move, right? I mean, do we know mm. or that's just the most, you know, that, perhaps is IBM has made an official statement that 
um, Red Hat was going to do this anyhow, quote unquote. It wasn't us. Uh, <laughs> which, yeah, which it was, it was the IBMers was embedded Hat. into Red Hat. <laughs> was it just which police told that it was IBM, but it was IBM holding the knife. It was Red Hat who actually pushed it forward. <laughs> uh, that's funny. So, is I, there is I there just, consensus to migrate off of CentOS to Ubuntu LTS, especially for HPC use cases? Absolutely not. Ubuntu does not support. I mean, long term, been, long term Ubuntu is not ability. Yeah, Ubuntu is not useful in a except maybe as a container or as a <laughs> uh, as a virtualization <laughs> system um, in HPC generally. Yeah. <laughs> FreeBSD. <laughs> it's my desktop. Yeah. Free, yeah. FreeBSD. What? Oh, sorry. So uh, somebody I says mean, that I have to whip out the. I have to whip out the tattoo. I, I was just saying, like, uh, it, 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 we might end up seeing uh, migration to FreeBSD or similar as just uh, the underlying platform, like the non-container one. Um. Sadly, I don't think so. Just simply because, again, the tooling's not there for HPC. Um, you know, the IPMI libraries, the, um, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it just, there's no, so we, much we, there. We in, count on yeah. CentOS as the base, right? I mean, for, for what we do, we bake, um, CentOS was seven. We just migrated to eight, um, as, as the discovery image. And we do that because it's so universally supported. The worst thing is, is they waited until right until the wave of people who had been putting off updating to eight mm. started kind of pushing over. So it was like, it was right as the, you know, everybody who'd been saying, okay, we'll update to eight next year kind of thing. We'll update <laughs> to eight next year. And then this year, uh, yay COVID, um, everybody started pushing over to eight. And so yeah. that, that kind of, it started that wave of people switching to eight started. But then now you've got people who were switching to eight who are now locked in and saying, oh, we just spent all of this time, money, effort to switch over to eight. And now you're telling me eight's EOL next year? Mm -hmm. But it's that not. was a 10-year I mean, life cycle. Wait, wait. But, I mean, one, Red Hat sells support for RHEL, right? I mean, that's... Well, yeah, which is yeah. on a five-year cycle. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and then you and can Cento, purchase Cento, Cento digital was... life if you really, really want oh. So, but on a few, big, like, hmm. so first off, I think somebody asked the question, what's the next move? This wasn't done in isolation. No, right. It was, there's, there's it was a, a force to, 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 to RHEL. I mean, it was really, truly, let's, yeah. let's take all of these CentOS, let's take all of the CentOS <laughs> movement and people and turn it into our upstream. Let's do what, yeah. with CentOS, what, what we've been doing with Fedora. Yeah. Let's sure. put everybody on. What's the happened, what's happened with Fedora? Nothing. I mean, it's Fedora. I mean, people use yeah. it as a desktop operating system. People will not yeah. use Fedora as a server for this reason. For that same reason, mm -hmm. yeah. But but it's upstream. It's essentially Fedora now. But then yeah. CentOS, the new CentOS kind of competes with Fedora, right? It mm -hmm. does. Yes. But, but I, IBM owns all of them. So what does it matter to them? Yeah. Well, as long as they can funnel everyone into RHEL, and paid right. subscriptions, it doesn't matter to them. Right. It's that, that, was, that was the There's, plan all. This is what's what to me is funny, right? It's that was the plan all along. Is yep. you know, is that you were supposed to go, you know, that's why they bought the CentOS team. Because yep. they were trying to, you know, they want you to move into the, the paid But then you'd expect it to be consultative, right? That no. is to no. Why they bought it. I, I, look, I mean I'm just I'm, 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 I'm putting a management. <laughs> I, I put my marketing ad on and I go like, look, I've got too many people jumping to eight, right? They're locked in for a 10 year cycle. I want to force them to basically go upstream. Now's the time to make the change before you yeah. have too much of a backlash, right? And then I've got a lack of HPC feature. The next thing I'm looking for is how do I start introducing more of those into the core platform so they have a migration path to it. Yeah. And then the third thing I sit here looking at going like this 10 year release cycle as a software person, that's hideous. Yeah, Ten years of support is unmaintainable. So how do I force the market back to five? That's what I'm kind of saying. What's the next steps? I think yeah. it's probably a bit more thought out than just. Don't know. 
that'd be my guess. The, the, well, the well, irony well, to me is well. that we never saw CentOS as that stable, right? They yank the ISOs for older releases, like you know, the day the day they come out with a new drop. So we, we you know we were always battling the libraries and stuff like that, not you know not being there when when people needed it. Um, well, you just that's why you aim at the vault instead of at the at the main line. Uh, so yeah. day one on a release, it goes into vault. Mm -hmm. So if you want stability, you aim at the vault. Mm -hmm. Yep. So on day one, releases move into the vault on launch, including mm -hmm. a copy of what is released on that launch day. Mm -hmm. So if you want ultra stability, you aim at the, well, previously, you'd aim at the vault. <laughs> but everything was vaulted. And so that that's 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 where you know your re your release structure would work for that. But yeah, yeah. it's the rocky stuff is is interesting and it has the potential. And holy crap, does it have a lot of people um, pushing <laughs> it, trying to move it forward? So and there there seems to be a good amount of structure, a good a lot of uh, a good amount of intention, and the the amount of donations like that people are willing to offer for like hardware and software and time and effort is pretty extreme. So I'm hoping that a lot of good things will come out of it. Yeah, it seems to me for a, a long, so 10 year release cycle, 10 year support cycle, you, the hardest problem is maintaining the code base, right? So keeping patch shovel up and so on. No. And that's that's a expensive. Lot of work to back rub patches and to, yeah. to to keep, well, in addition to that, to also maintaining forward movement. I mean, that's been, always been one of the most difficult aspects of this, but it's it's also solved a lot, at least in HPC, through containers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, that's one of the joys of singularity is the fact that, you know, you can have this beautiful 44,000 node HPC structure that works beautifully uh, with these ultra stable libraries underneath. And then if you want your latest, greatest whiz bang editor, compiler, whatever, you just fire up Singularity in your, you know, CentOS 12 container or whatever, or yeah. and away you go. What so, about what about device drivers? I mean, I would imagine um, device that's drivers? A nightmare. So it, it, they're not that bad with regards to. At least, at least you using like um, specifically for like uh, uh, um, ATI and and uh, uh, NVIDIA drivers and, yeah. and common release drivers and things like that. It's not that bad. Hmm. Uh, maintaining it at least underneath Singularity, it hasn't been bad at all. Um, hmm. There's hmm. there's there's a lot of effort out there to maintain that. Um, yeah. But again, that's when when you've got a single like everyone supported CentOS, so that was one of those things. Is that it's it's you know it, it's the standard Linux kernel. Um, everybody pretty much supported CentOS to some extent or another. I don't know if that's going to be the case moving forward, though. That which is a major concern. But, yeah. Uh and like you like you said that everybody was moving to eight so it's not like most of the people were not sticking with a 10-year cycle but having the ability to stick with the cycle if necessary is well yeah key. i mean if you take a look at hpc and if you take a look at um eda where i'm more focused um uh it's the silicon development that sort of thing um it's very common to stick with, with um uh older releases just because the the software vendors don't move their support very quickly at least in the eda world um yeah. getting synopsis to support you know or getting um cadence to support a uh, a modern operating system is amazingly painful um and they've done that <laughs> yeah, yeah same so I, I was in release at cadence for a while <laughs> ah very good yes then then you, then you know well um yeah i have i've quite a few people over there who uh, so I actually release all of my um, EDA tools inside Singularity containers now. So that's how I just, it's my users all don't even know they're calling Singularity containers. Beautiful. When they're using their, their you know, uh, DV scripts or they're using their design scripts, 
um, they're they're actually firing up a, a cadence tool that's inside of a singularity container, and they don't even know it. Um, that's actually running in CentOS seven container mm. on side uh, inside of a RHEL eight point three machine <laughs> on the most modern kernel. So they don't know it, um, but that they do know that hey, they can run their latest greatest editor. They can run the latest, greatest Python. They can run the latest, greatest, whatever they want, but then still also get access to these legacy tools. And these legacy tools believe that they're running in a fully compatible environment because they are. But um, yeah, what I was going to say, though, is that, that a lot of these uh, uh, older installations and HP installation, HPC installations are still running on CentOS 6. Yeah. In some instances, in CentOS 7, in some instances. And wow. 6 is EOL. Right. But they're still being forced to run on it because for whatever reasons, um, whether it be a specific driver, whether it be they have a piece of software that cannot be re-engineered, um, whether they have to support, you know, some of the particle physics laboratories, they have very specific hardware that cannot be, you know, that they've got an interface which is written that they can't, they can't do it. But that 10 year life cycle gave them too. design time to migrate. Sorry, Rocky, I didn't mean to talk over you. Uh, no, I didn't mean to talk over you, but space space applications too. You're talking to satellites that are 10, 20, 30 years old. Yeah, find an X25 or, or uh, something driver uh, for, uh, <laughs> for a CentOS 8. It, it's very difficult. They're out there, but. Um, you know, or or take it another another step backwards. You know, thirty two seventy emulation. You know, it's yeah. And uh, the IoT world is going to uh, uh, the industrial IoT world is another one that feeds into the need for those long, long lived OSs because once something's out in the field, for instance, um, there are oil field monitors out in the permafrost of Canada that are connected with CDMA modems and they haven't been touched for five to seven years and they just keep broadcasting and you can't really update those puppies or mm -hmm. the sensors attached to them. Yeah. I just had a fight with Gartner, which is always a pleasure, um, <laughs> about AI at the edge. And, yeah. um, you know, cause we do a ton of stuff in smart cities. And they were going about, well, you have to, your software has to run on the traffic light. To do <laughs> I'm like, do what? it. You know. Yeah. I'm sorry. That stuff's not going to get changed ever. Mm -mm. I do, I do think we've gotten with cloud stuff, we've gotten really lazy about the longevity and life cycle of, of infrastructure. Well, CD, you know, the hypervisor. <laughs> sorry. I, you know, the hypervisor was a try at fixing that, right? So mm -hmm. it was the low level hardware interface with an ability to hand off at least a clean abstraction to VMs above it. It turns out, you no know, containers are another way, but um, it's certainly a way to do it. And certainly, I think the LF Edge stuff, right, which is hypervisors for edge things, it may work, but may not that is it's not clear to me that vendors will support that they'll just continue to embed stuff but you know supporting abstractions which abstract away hardware problems and allowing the software to move on is a good thing it it is in general but again you know if you, you start looking at the broader use of another yet another layer of indirection functionally yes it does solve the problem um but you know at, let's let's use the same hpc use case we're talking about right so there are lots and lots of sticking points why stability matters mm -hmm. um why we have to contend with it my particular use case is we have this massive cluster and it needs to be hybrid because the emulation that I'm working on, it's done in hardware specifically. These are cognitive radios. Um, and then, you know, there's a compute cluster built on a cluster of cognitive radios and their stability matters because the, the what you're getting out of these emulation scenarios is so precise and they're so, I mean, the cardinality is so high. Hmm. 
to add yet another layer of to start saying, okay, now when we are going to do quote unquote rolling upgrades through multiple quadrants of this compute cluster, you know, to add another layer of complexity and start saying, okay, you know, you could have a heterogeneous environment in hardware, software, OS, different patch levels, and how to add that in, how to start saying, okay, we're going to start normalizing this so the top end captures and already accounts for heterogeneity at the you know software layer, at the hardware layer. So, you know, in some cases abstraction helps. In other cases where abstraction is just there to, you know, kind of abstract away the hardware per se, um, there it doesn't help because <laughs> you know, the problem becomes intractable, right? How do you normalize across this disparate infrastructure footprint, right? Whether that's hardware, software. So in some cases, abstraction helps. In other cases where you got to say, okay, now I got to, you know, go tease through and, you know, run another experiment on how hard the normalization would be. That becomes really hard. Um, yeah. there, there you have to say, okay, you know, if I'm abstracting, every layer of abstraction, I have to do, you know, a full uplift, right? The mass upgrade yeah. at each abstraction layer. That's hard. Well, it's cost. It is. And to tie it back to like the, the smart Nick conversation, right? What you wind up with is lowest <laughs> common denominator, right? What's the level of abstraction that everyone supports so I can run across these components? And then yeah, there's the a trade -off. Yeah, that's right. You're absolutely right. Created. <laughs> Uh, shoot. All right. By, by, well, so wait, by, by, I have by a the question way, I'm, I'm going to have a hard stop at 1245. I got invited to be part of the cube uh, reinvent analysis just as a, um, I can promote somebody and y'all can keep going if you want, but um, I was, you want to so do what, your infrastructure as code? <laughs> uh, I, was, I, I do, I do want to, I, I, yeah, actually, if you well, watch the keynote, he was, he was all about what we're talking about here, which is things are super complex. We need a whole bunch of operational tooling. You know, our system's really hard to use and confusing and we, we, we've got to help people use it. Um, I think smart, I think smart nicks are both amazing and operationally, I, I think you're entirely right. That was like smart nicks are going to make people's heads explode as an op, as a management plane. Thank you for joining us in another Cloud 2030 DevOps Lunch and Learn discussion. If this was exciting to you and these topics are interesting, we have discussions like this every week. Just come in and enjoy uh, some DevOps uh, discussion and camaraderie at the2030.cloud. Thanks.